Uh, welcome to the Morelli End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined as always by Estelle Vazi, Devon, Dominic Machado and Nick Brooks. I say as always, actually, it's been a while since the four of us have been united, at least at the start of an episode. Before we crack on, uh, just remind us to, to sign up to our newsletter every week, maybe every kind of 10 days. Um, a newsletter drops into your email filled with some great writing on Sri Lankan cricket. Uh, we, we talk about all parts of the game and uh, we, we try and cover everything. There's a huge back catalogue of it now as well. The link is in the description. It's on our social accounts as well. Go sign up. It's all for free. Um, today, I think we need to have a look at the test match, the first test against Bangladesh, have a look at kind of what might happen in the second test. Um, I think we need to talk a little bit more about the rivalry because I'll never get over that Bangladesh dare to even play cricket. Uh, we should also talk about the women's series that has started there in South Africa. They're playing that as we speak, um, as we record. And uh, let's also have a little bit of a chat about the shrunken players in the IPL, or maybe the lack of the shrunken players who actually made it onto the pitch at the IPL. Um, Nick, let's start with you. Do you want to give us your take on the test match over the weekend? And what ended up being quite you an emphatic win against Bangladesh. Really emphatic win, right? And it didn't look like it was going to be on the first morning when Sri Lanka slipped five mm. wickets down for not many. Uh, man, what a find Kamindu Mendes has been over the past few months, looking really like he's going to turn out to be an all-format player for Sri Lanka, right? I think that, uh, you know... Obviously, we've heard a lot about him. I remember him playing, I think, first for Sri Lanka what, right back in 2018. And it kind of looked for a while like he was going to be one that fell up by the wayside, like the opportunity was gone. But I mean, God, he's just stroked the ball magnificently, both in T20 cricket and now in Test cricket. So he's a really interesting prospect for Sri Lanka moving forward. And I mean, everyone's talking about it. The first time a Sri Lankan attack has taken 20 seam wickets since I think 1986 or 1987. I was trying to find the exact test they did this last in, but they did it the whole time in the 80s because they had no spinners to show and you know Demel and the Ratnayakas were really going but, but um, I thought they bowled brilliantly with great control I was really impressed with all three of them the way they bowled as a pack and to do it without pack leader Sita Fernando is hugely impressive and so yeah looking forward to seeing more of that in the second test I hope. Um, Estelle our fast bowling unit um, from a test perspective at least seems to be coming along quite nicely right? Yeah it's been excellent right and if you look at you look at the full picture, there are six, seven, eight bowlers who can really make an impact, I think, in, in any format of the game. And that's great. But we, we are hearing that Kasun Rajita is injured. Sri Lanka's biggest problem has been not producing fast bowlers, but keeping them all fit together, right? Anytime we think of like the perfect combination in T20 cricket or ODI cricket or Test cricket, inevitably one or two of them is not available um, and that's the biggest problem and uh, there have been some changes in the coaching staff hopefully with the new physio coming in we, we can sort out those injuries um, but yeah they were excellent I felt I mean Kumara gets a lot of shit all the time but he was so good in that test and I do think yeah, you, you love to use him in limited overs cricket where he can really cause some problems, particularly mm. against the lower-ranked teams. But in test cricket, having that enforcer-type bowler is so important because uh, I remember it was, I think it was in the first innings where Bangladesh was just building a little bit of a partnership and he comes in and he's immediately effective just because of the pace he's about to, uh, able to generate as well as the fact that in test cricket, he doesn't have as much pressure about, mm -hmm. you know, the direction, right? Um, he has that time to settle in. And even if he gets a couple of deliveries wrong in terms of line and length, there's not much for him to lose in that aspect. So I thought he was really good. Rajita and Vishwa, I mean, have been consistently mm -hmm. good in test cricket, I feel. So, you know, they've just continued on. Mostly, I was really happy to see a track where... There was more for the fast bowlers than the spinners, particularly in a in a game that involved two countries who kind of thrive in spin bowling conditions. Um, Dom, the the bowling's going well. The the batting we kind of all feel was was our strength. When it 
starting on that first day, it looked like, oh gosh, we're starting slow again. What's going on here? Uh, wickets falling all over the place. And then I'm going to say what I thought was probably the most unlikeliest batting partnership proved to be our most fruitful in both innings. DDS, new captain, really grabbed it by the by mm. the throat, didn't he? He's it's strange because I think when you you know he's he's a good looking chap with a lovely smile. But actually, what you don't notice if you just watch him, like if, if you watch him casually, and not like we are, like total um, cricket badgers, is that he's actually quite abrasive, right? He's really in the face of of the of the other team, and not in the face so much. But he's, you know, he, he's got an idea and a clear vision of how he wants to play and how he wants to bat. And it's seemingly after the first test. It feels kind of talismatic, like he wants to be that talisman. Mm-hmm. And he definitely was that in that first innings. And, you know, he was it in the second innings as well. But obviously, you know, the amount of runs he picked up was slightly eclipsed by Kamindi Mendes. What was your read on the two innings with, with the bat? Yeah, I thought he was brilliant. I think, you know, he's he's played three innings as captain and made 300s, right? Um, that first test against Afghanistan, he also got 100, um, if I'm remembering correctly. But now his his average is above 40, right? He has made that number six position his own. And he just has an idea of how he wants to bat there. He bats well against pace, bats well against spin. He has the time to get in and play the strokes he wants to play. And I thought... Uh, he and Kamindu look great together, right? Left hand, right hand combination down the order, both very pleasing on the eye, uh, both capable of handling pace and spin. And it looks uh, quite productive. I think, you know, the the top order, I'm perhaps a little bit more sympathetic to their struggles than than some other might other people might be. Um, I think the way that Sri Lanka play test cricket is always really tricky. You know, it's on the back of a one day t20 series um certain guys have been out there for weeks now um limited time to play at home and domestic um cricket as well to warm up so i'd like to see them pick it up in the second match and i'm hopeful that they will but i think it's a little bit we have to be a little bit careful about evaluating some of these players um and i'll talk about kusal mendes in a in a minute because of the circumstances under which they play test cricket so people have looked at Mendes's last six innings or whatever right and we get this this first test coming off of a long t20 series where he opens keeps right odi series where he bats at three keeps and is captain um and then the other two series we've just played uh we had a one-off test against afghanistan same same exact circumstances after a t20 series after a one-day series no actually that was to start right no the the test series was to start that was the first yeah ending. yeah so yeah my bad on that but the um the pakistan series came right after world cup qualifying last time and those are the six innings and they're all about a few months apart so there's no consistency it's not like he's playing a five match series against australia or india and you know you can say okay he hasn't adjusted at all it's a bit of a we'll pop you in after telling you to basically keep captain and open the batting which is a big a big ask and so i think and then you know you're asking someone like demuth to just come out from the cold right he's been at home he's playing a little bit of four-day cricket and now all of a sudden you have to go in and bat and and someone like Nishan Madushka same same circumstance so I have a little bit of sympathy for the top order mainly because how how does one get ready for a test series when it comes at the end of a long tour there's no you know there's no tour matches to to change up your mindset as you're preparing for a world cup so I have a little bit of sympathy for the top order failure um so all the more marks for DDS and Kamindu for coming out there and making the most out of it yeah, I, like I'm really surprised at how quickly people jump on our, some of our top order players when they don't make runs, right? Dimuth, Angelo, and even you know I'll get slated for saying this, but even jammed about. Actually, they've been pretty consistent servants to the test side for almost a decade, all of them now, if not longer, actually. Um, but 
a couple, you know, effectively, you know, actually Dimith kind of made runs. I think he got, what, 70? He got a, uh, a 50 in the second innings. I think he got yeah. eight, 16 or 17 in the first innings, right? Um, but it kind of feels unless those three don't get centuries or don't get near a century, then we kind of, there's the calls are to, to get rid of them. I think the Kissel Mendes issue is much more interesting and I think, you know, he maybe they need to sit down and be like, is it in the best interest of Kussel and of the team for him to continue to play test cricket? Because I feel like Sadir is really knocking that door down because he feels like if, you, if, if you've if you watched the ODI team, he looks like, well, I suppose you could say Patim or, or, or Charith could, could both be test players as well. But Sadir looks like he plays ODI cricket in a way that's very well suited for test cricket. And they kind of just gave him an opportunity and then kind of just, it, I, I think they've just kind of dropped him, right? So I think they maybe need to have a to have a look at that again. I think the problem is, though, is when you've won a test in the in the, mm. the, the, the nature that they have done, I kind of think you kind of, at this point, probably don't want to tinker with that team and drop players, uh, uh, you know, drop too many players. And I think looking ahead... You know, the, the thing I'm most excited about this year in terms of test cricket for Sri Lanka is obviously when they come to, to the UK. I think Kussel might be a kind of slightly better option against so-called Basball um, than, than Sidera might be. So that, that might be in the in the selectors' minds. I don't know, Nick, what, what's your thoughts on, on the, the Kussel-Mendis test conundrum? Yeah, I think it's a really complicated one, actually. And I was really surprised when Estelle shared that stat that he was averaging 22 or something around there when you take Ireland out of the equation I was just having a look at his recent scores and it's interesting that he was kind of before those Ireland tests when he scored loads of runs he'd been going all right he'd got an 87 and a 50 mm -hmm. against New Zealand uh an 85 against Australia when they came in 2022 and it's the last little period of nine months that's been really fallow for him, which is strange because it coincides as I think what we'd agree is probably his most fruitful period as a white ball cricketer. I wonder whether that, uh, like Dom said, it's not easy switching between formats and he seems to have made an effort, a concerted effort to get more aggressive in white ball cricket. And I wonder if that's had an impact on his red ball game. I think the way he got out in this test will ghoul people, right? In both yeah. innings, uh, like what's he doing in the first innings playing off the face of his bat to a packed slip cord and the second innings it's a ball that's overhead height he's got no business playing at it he's I don't think he was even looking at it when the ball touched the bat but I mean it's not easy batting in the top three and as much as Cussell hasn't lived up to his potential I think there aren't that many better players around for me the more pressing issue is how is he going to carry on batting three and keeping wicket? Uh, mm. Because, I mean, I don't think... Uh, Sanger couldn't do it. I can't touch on anyone who's done it for a long period since. And I think it's going to be a lot to ask of him, especially in England. Uh, I don't mind the fact that they dropped Sadira because as from what I've seen, apart from that 100 that he got against Ireland, I haven't been that convinced by Sadir in tests thus far. I know it's a fairly mm. small sample size. Uh, but yeah, I don't know what really happens. I can't see Kussel Mendes shifting down to seven. Uh, I think that's out of the question, whether he can shift to five or six. But, you know, I know Kamindu bats three in domestic cricket, but he's just made a great start to his career at seven. I think you're loath to kind of shift things around. So it's a, it's a bit of a conundrum, that, for Sri Lanka, as far as I can see it. Estelle, I feel like you're the most passionate about uh, Kissel Mendes' <laughs> role in the test side. Do you want to tell us your thoughts on it? Yeah, I think, look, I was also caught, to be honest, I was caught by surprise looking at his stats for the last five years. I didn't expect it to be that bad. Um, I mean, less than, I think less than 800 runs against teams, the top eight teams um, in the world is is nowhere near good enough for your number three batter. Um, like Dom said, I understand the, the difficulty in switching formats. And that's why I think you don't need him to do that you can get let him do what he does best in limited overs cricket because let's be honest okay he's been hailed as the most talented cricketer in sri lanka the most talented batter we've seen since the sangamahela era but he hasn't 
he hasn't lived up to that promise and i feel a lot of that has to do with he's still very unsure about what he's supposed to do i mean in t20 mm. cricket i think he's very, he has a lot of clarity on how he needs to go about things but i don't think we see that kind of clarity even in odi cricket where you feel you feel like he plays a lot of he's not sure whether he should be all out attack like we saw in the first two games of the world cup or is he going to you know does he need to bat through the innings and be that guy who holds the batting together it doesn't help that sri lanka haven't been batting well in odi cricket and now test cricket this like while he's having such a bad run to hand him the gloves and ask him to bat at number 3 is kind of absurd i feel because you're already having a guy who you want him to do well because if he does well you know you're going to see a lot of success and then you give him that added bit of uh, responsibility and no matter how fit you are it's going to affect you right like i mean we saw how sanga's stats kind of soared after he gave up mm-hmm. the gloves um so i i I feel like there is I mean this would be the worst time to do it to be honest with an England series coming up but I feel like a break he needs a break and he needs to be given that that freedom to focus on the form, the one format which he's done brilliant in uh, at least until the world cup is done because you need a firing Kusal Mendes at the world cup right in terms of other options I feel like you know even with kamindu a year from now if he's not making runs a lot of people are going to be like look he only made runs against bangladesh um you know uh, he's batting at number 7 he didn't have you know that much i mean the ball was old whatever all those things are going to come up i think that that is the big problem mm. is that uh, any new play is going to take time because sri lankan players at the moment and in the past like 10 15 years they are learning international cricket while playing international cricket so it, whoever if they do bring somebody in they need to be patient with that guy i feel because it's not going to produce immediate results um and you're not like hailing them as the next uh, as next sanga or whatever is not going to help matters so i think that's important to keep in mind because kamindu is a guy who is i think averaging 65 plus in first class cricket and he's been doing that for like the last 4 to 5 years right so he's it's not been one year of batting well he's consistently been doing well and now he's got his opportunity and performed well at the international arena but it's not going to be the same with everybody i mean mm. you might pick uh, han vikram singh or nipun dadanje or nuni the fernando they might not succeed immediately as soon as they come into the team but you have to understand the kind of uh, challenge that sri lankan players face and mm-hmm. i think that's why it's important that they do also have a few experienced players in that side dimut chandimal and i would say dds have been sri lanka's three best batters over the last couple of years angelo has got some runs but i don't think he's anywhere near his best Uh, but uh, I think it's we'll important. Clear, we'll clear that... this bit up for social, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Estelle said Chandamal was one of the best batters. Mark said Chandamal makes runs. Don't come back. Te- best batters. I heard best batters. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think it's important to have that kind of mix so that a guy like Kamidu can come in and have that bit of experience around him and not have to take the blame when the batting doesn't go well right like we saw when the kind of youth revolution kind of thing was implemented once they didn't do well oh it's all the young guys are not doing well and all the young guys are being kind of sidelined um so it's good to kind of have that mix i think um oh okay. i was going to say mark i was going to add in i think a big part of this i will say the one smart thing is that they're keeping nisanka and charith away from the test team right now because their focus should solely be on this world cup that's coming up. So I think uh one of the difficulties is three format players now are very rare. Um there are very few people who do it. Particularly batters, right? Yeah, particularly batters, right? And 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 uh Kusal is the only one that we have at the moment. Um and i think coming in at 3 3 has been a very difficult spot for sri lanka to fill um dds you know all his talent he he they moved him up to 
um, a few years back and they moved him back to six where he bats brilliantly well and they shouldn't move him. Um, but even a player of that caliber, someone who we regard as as very, very talented and very, very good, uh, it can be tough. We tried Thirimana forever at three, um, you know, and, and he struggled there. We've tried so many different options. So I think that's one of the troubles is coming into that spot is a particularly tricky one. And, you know, I think the person who I would immediately think might be a good fit for that is Putham. And I want to hold off on that for the time being, right? I think maybe what happened has to happen too is as Demoth and Angelo kind of make way, then more options open up. You can move people up and down the order. Yeah. Um, you can do different things. And I, I tend to agree with Nick that Sadira hasn't, he's only scored one 50 plus score, which is his hundred against Ireland. Granted, he hasn't had as many chances, but I think, you know, I think as those guys move out, you can bring in um, someone like Nguyen Indo, right? You can bring in, you can, you can move someone like Nishan Madushka around the order a bit, right? I don't know if opening is exactly what he wants to do. I could see him again going down to three. You could have Potham open as well. So I think there will be a lot of options as some of these spots come open. And it seems pretty clear too, uh, Chandamal is the other option to take the gloves, but he definitely prefers not to keep Wicket. Um, so what does it mean when he's batting at five and not keeping Wicket, but your number three batter is keeping Wicket? Um, so there's a bit of a there's a bit of a balance thing, and I I think they've got that England series keyed in mind. And you know my my thought is they're they're just hoping Kosal will make runs this year this this test coming up, and that'll clear up some of the issues and the questions. Um, and it's also going to be a big adjustment for them to go to England because they haven't played a test series there since when 2018, I think it's is that been right? A while, yeah, yeah 17, it's been a while. 18, but... Yeah. Um, we should probably kind of, you know, hail the arrival of Kaminsky Mendes. I think mm. he's the the player that we we have hailed the most mm. the, this uh, this calendar year. He's really thus far he's really seized the moment, hasn't he? Um, and seized his chance. So I felt like, you know, I saw I saw you, I, I saw you on Twitter or somewhere say that um, he was kind of hamstrung by being noted. Quite early on in his in his teams, I think, in the when he was at the under nineteen World Cup as being the ambidextrous bowler. Obviously, mm. the ICC is um, ideologically opposed to Sri Lankan cricket success, so therefore, being okay. ambidextrous is absolutely no benefit at all to the bowler because the umpire tells the batsman where which side or which hand it's coming from, right? Um, and and I think early on. People assumed that because he could bowl with both hands, that was he was just another yet another Sri Lankan mystery spinner. But actually, he's an out and out batter, isn't he? And mm. it seems to me this could be the year of of of, men, of Kamindu if he keeps if he keeps on this same trajectory and takes his moment. Because what I'm really impressed by is when you see him play Red Bull cricket, he plays a proper good test style of cricket and when you see him play white ball cricket which i really was didn't think he could do from mm. what i'd seen before this year he actually he plays with that intent that he's meant to play and he's he's he plays the role that he's been given and i wonder if he, he might end up being the kind of the man that ends up being slotted about when we've got injuries or when when we need to reshuffle the order because you know we keep us can't bat at three or whatever it is and that he ends up be, being, I say, being the man for a lot of struggling players in the past. You think DDS, their career is actually, in a way, taken hits because they've ended up moving up and down orders and stuff like that. And I'm just, you know, I just want to A, big him up and B, say, you know, we, we need to make sure our talent are playing in the right places and make sure that SLC use him mm. in the right way because he's already had to, that kind of get into the side, get dropped be around the side and now he's back in it and, and he seized it. What do you say, Nick? Yeah, I totally agree with you, Marky. And it just, um, you brought me back to the chat we had with Prad a few weeks back where he said how much he thought that Kamindu had benefited from role clarity in T20 cricket internationally being given that license to come in and power play and really get after it. And so, yeah, I hope that he finds a stable spot 
across formats. I'd leave him in seven at seven in tests for the moment. He looks like someone who's just got a really clear head on his shoulders, right? Um, he knows his game. And I was like very impressed with how strong he looked through the covers against seam and spin. But also when in that second innings, when Sri Lanka got eight, nine down, how well he batted with the tail. Uh, yeah, it was really, really promising. And the last time we saw him in test cricket, he made a good 50 against Australia, right? Uh, so the signs are that he can be a player moving forward. And just going back to something Estelle said about half an hour ago, I was massively impressed with Lahiru Kumara in the first mm -hmm. innings. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, I've often, you have that kind of sinking feeling when he comes on to bowl in test cricket of like, oh, the pressure that, that's been built up is just about to totally dissipate. And mm -hmm. this was the opposite, right? He was banging away at that hard length, finding seam movement, bowling good pace. And if he can keep going like that, it could be, really um he could be really exciting for Sri Lanka moving forward I'm massively looking forward to these England tests uh I think it's going to be really interesting what they do with the squad and something Dom touched on like I think we would all like to see Patham unleashed in test cricket but are worried about what it might do for his white ball game and I mean I wonder if the England series could be the time when like you know the World Cup's been and gone there's no pressing white ball cricket on the horizon might we see um you know, a red herring or two thrown into the squad, uh, a rabbit drawn out of the hat. Um, who knows? He keeps wicket as well, you know. I have heard that he's a part-time keeper. I've never seen him behind the stump. Does he not? Does he not? Uh, cricket in know. England as your first, as your first uh, <laughs> international wicket keeping experience, right? He doesn't keep. Does he? Yeah, not? I've never sure. seen him keep. Right? No, no. I'm sure I've read somewhere that he ke keeps. Wicket. Nishan Madushka keeps, but no, not Patu. Oh, yeah, Nishan Madushka. I does. think because Patu and Lahiru Udara were kind of the two guys who are doing really well at the same time, and Udara keeps. Yeah. Oh, so okay. maybe, yeah. And Udara is in the squad. That's the mm. other. But again, it, it's tough to change squads. Yeah. Uh, one quick shout out for Kasan Rajatha. Um, mm. You know, we we sometimes malign the job he does in white ball cricket. He was. Excellent. I think the thing that was so impressive was um, working with Wishwa and and um, and Kamara. But he seems like he, you know, he always had that away swinger against the right hander. Now he seems like he can bring it back in as well. So you can see he's developing skills. He's kind of got this Luckmall like trajectory where you're like, is he ever going to put it together? And then once he does, he's got the, he's a really skillful bowler who can do things. Um, reverse swing. I was impressed by him taking advantage of some of the reverse swing and later on in the over. So um, shout out to him. Sad that he's going to miss this next match, but then excited to get our, our pit bull Asita Fernando back in as well. I I, I thought Kasten Rajda was the one shrunken person across the world that was impossible to injure. Because he's always the guy who's called up for the World Cup, right? It's like he's like eight choice sitting there at, like on the beach or whatever he does when he's not playing, and then suddenly he's like the bat phone rings and he's on a flight to Melbourne. Um, Ultimate well, warrior. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I was really surprised to see that he was injured. I was like, no, not cussing as well. I didn't think that's possible. Um, yeah, gutted, gutted for him because he, he was he was great on the weekend, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, absolutely great. Guys, can we talk about Bangladesh shithousing, please? Because <laughs> like that attempted that attempted man cad was embarrassing, wasn't it? <laughs> like, I just don't know what's wrong with them. Like, what why are they why are they like this? Um, Mark, you're the person who has to answer to this. To the, yeah. the what, what's your opinion on the so if it had worked? Would you what would you, would you have been mad or would you have been upset? <laughs> Look, if it worked, I've got to like I've got to be consistent with my view is if it works, it works, right? But if you're gonna do it, make sure it works. Yeah. Now they've got <laughs> no. the worst of both worlds. They've got <laughs> they have got total Bangladesh cricket on this. They've got like they've tried to do something and it has not worked. And now we can all sit back and laugh at them. And I don't I'm not even sure when I watched that video that he was out of the crease anyway. I think, but, but I think that's the natural moving out of the crease. Yeah, yeah. you can't do that though, right? Yeah. You can't yeah. flick it back, no. Yeah, no. Someone, no. someone's tried to do it, and they've been told that they can't do it, right? Because once you're through the action, you're through the action, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to say, like, oh god, it's like they. It's like Shakib's back for the second test. Oh great. <laughs> <laughs> 
straight out of the shit house. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh God, it reminded me of like a shit Stuart Broad. Like they brought Stuart Broad from Wish or something, right? Because it's that total trying to, we're going to play at the edge of it, but then we're going to get it all wrong. And oh, terrible. I can't, I, I, like it, it, it's kind of, it is really funny, but you know, on, on a side note, I actually think it's great how, you know, I said this last week as well. It's great how kind of dirty this rivalry is becoming, <laughs> right? Uh, because it's it's made the series that was something that we mm. did annually into something, right? And the fact that so many people are talking about it. Talking about obviously, it. Obviously, yeah. we're talking about it, but I've seen loads of people talk about it. I've mm. seen them mention it across loads of other pods and, and loads of other things. So, you know, I think it's only... By 2030, the Nargan is going to be bigger than the Ashes. I'm just putting that out there. Like people, people. And it's so it. funny because in both instances, it's just started off as like an innocent thing, right? Yeah. That poor, I can't even remember his name. That poor Bangladeshi bowler who yeah, used to just bowler, do the, right? yeah, I can see do him. the Nargan yeah. celebration in his club games. Suddenly, I don't think even Danushka Gunatilaka intended for it to become anything when I mean he he also did it when he when they got that bowler out. But then it suddenly turned into like something crazy, right? Yeah. I I, I like but it like so there was the there was the nulgin and then the timed out though. That's gotta live like because people <laughs> I don't think people outside of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, really knew about the Nargin. Yeah, right, to be yeah, honest. yeah. But then that timed out. That was like on the back pages of newspapers around the world. Mm. Like, and also Mushfiq's uh, reenactment of the yeah, moment. The helmet. <laughs> it's like, are you twelve years old? Yeah. With with his broken with his broken arm. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, we also need to mention was it Shanto shot where he just uh, Linda, Linda. No. Yeah. Lind- li- oh man, what was going on there? Kind of if I if I like it'd be tragic if I I wasn't so opposed to Bangladeshi cricket. Um <laughs> but oh gosh. I don't anyway. think I've seen a shot be so widely called out on Twitter. Yeah, so yeah I know people being like, This is the worst thing I've ever seen in Test cricket. Yeah, it's funny, right? Like Mark mentioned. This whole rivalry, whether you love it or hate it, it's making people watch. Yeah. People who usually don't watch, watch it, right? And follow it. And I think that kind of affected the Litton Das thing because mm. a lot of the times that shot, it was a horrible shot with like two <laughs> overs to go in the day. But that doesn't happen as rarely as people yeah. are making it seem with this shot. It happens. But I think it's just because people are so kind of anything you see on Bangladesh, Sri Lanka being shared on social media, it automatically people are curious about because of this whole thing because they're wondering if there's going to be some other little argument or fight or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Joe Root took a shot in in India. I think it was was it the third test when he got out with a weird reverse sweep type thing. Yeah, that I, I actually think was probably a worse cricket shot, right? Um, yeah, this guy's shot. It wasn't the shot. No, it was the it was fact that they were shot. four wickets down yeah. and three overs left for the end of the day's play. I think that was the issue. I mean, if he had come out the next day and played the shot, maybe he doesn't get as much <laughs> uh, criticism for it. Um, uh, the the other thing that's worth mentioning about this series is in the UK and continental Europe. Um, it's available for free on YouTube, which there's. You know, considering there's so much discourse about how much you know it costs to watch Test cricket, not just in the UK but across the world, and also you know Test cricket dying, I think the fact that this rivalry exists and the fact that in large parts of the world it's free to air is only a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to say, you know, like even compared to the New Zealand Australia Test series that happened, with which are two much better Test size. I didn't see as much coverage and maybe it's just my, you know, sort of the algorithm feeding me what I, what I want to look at, but I didn't see much discussion, but it's here. And um, one last thing, Chandika, uh, uh, Hathrasinghe is going to Australia to tend to matters. Mark, you've, you've embarrassed him out of, out of, uh, out of Bangladesh. Not, not me. It's not me. (laughs) He's done that to himself. Like he has done that to himself. I like, 
I, I don't know. I don't want to say anything too incendiary. I don't want them to come after me like, you know, they, they <laughs> might come after Nick during the week or whatever, right? I am firmly <laughs> on the side of Sri Lankan cricket and the prosperity of all Sri Lankans, um, as is Nick, I should, should point Yeah, out and I've well. actually got to say, I've, um, when I chatted to Hatu, he's an absolutely lovely man, top bloke. Mm. <laughs> you, you see, though, that I think that's quite obvious in the way he talked, right? Like... He kind of Stop. understands it. I think in, in 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 Sri Lanka, or not just in Sri Lanka, I think a, cricket has a wider problem where they don't realise that when sport becomes professional, then it becomes it's marketing first and sport second, right? Because it's about getting eyes on the game to watch it and bums into seats and kids wearing the shirts. And sometimes because of the whole bloody spirit of cricket thing and the, uh, the reverence people have for the game, then actually sometimes the whole marketing aspect of it gets can get a little bit lost in 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 the in the thing where actually the you know as i keep saying the rivalry is the best thing that's ever happened he really fully understands the role that coaches can play yeah. in building this stuff up you know the, the and, and really people i'm sure i've never talked to them but i'm sure people at like angelo and hasaranga know that as well and they they figure this 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 out as well. It's 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 about it. Ultimately, that's how they make money. Yeah. If no one's no one's interested in their games, they don't make as much money as they do. Um, so yeah, it's what it it's what makes the shit housing is what makes the world go round. And that's why I'm a big fan of it, particularly when it's Bangladesh and it's fake shit housing or attempts at shit housing. <laughs> to be like, fair, Hathra Singer did call out Angelo when he was his coach. <laughs> yeah, that's what this is carrying on from, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, he's the main agenda uncle, right? <laughs> like, Exiled agenda uncle. Exiled agenda uncle. Um, should we talk about the women are in South Africa? The first ODI is going, is playing as as we are talking. The uh, South Africa made 198 for five. And currently, as I speak... Sri Lanka are 39 for two of 5.2 overs. Is this going to be a, 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 a tough series for Sri Lanka or can they get some results? What do you think, Don? Well, I, uh, I I have to admit, I was asking Estelle about this prior to coming on. You know, do we think that Sri Lanka have a chance? And, uh, you know, Estelle mentioned that South Africa had a poor series against Australia um, previously. But of course, uh, we've seen even after tough first matches, the Sri Lankan women fight back, right? Um, we saw how they got sent around the park on that uh, cold, miserable day in England and then came back and showed that fighting spirit. I think, um, you know, this is the first international match they've played all year. They need a little bit of time to get back into it. So, yes, it might have been a tough first match today, but I think they have some they have a chance to um, cause some trouble to the South Africans. Right. The last match they played before this, um, they won in the World Cup in South Africa. So they have done it before. Um, South Africa, of course, is a very talented team, I think the big difficulty is going to be separating those partnerships at the top. How do you get Wolvert and Cap out? And um, because that, that was what really changed the match today. And then um, seeing, you know, the, the Sri Lankan batters other than Chamri continue to step up and put in good performances is the other key thing, because obviously everyone is gunning for Chamri. Everyone's looking for her wicket and it's time for, you know, Harsatha, to step up to to show what she's been showing in the domestic game as well. So I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. I think this team has a lot of fight in them. They have very talented and experienced players now at this point. So I think um, they will definitely win one of the T20 matches, and I think they'll give a fist of it for the series. Are you as optimistic as though? I think it's it's an interesting one, right? Like. Dom mentioned the last time Sri Lanka played South Africa, we beat them in, in that World Cup opener. There were a lot of factors at play, I think, then, because um, South Africa were having a few issues behind the scenes. The pitch was kind of slow and like completely played into Sri Lanka's hands. Um, just having watched South Africa bat today, for the most part, I think they've kind of addressed those issues in that, you know, there were a lot more... You know they were they were a lot more attacking. They tried to take 
each of Sri Lanka's bowlers on, particularly the likes of Ino Karanavira, because they know that they can have a huge impact on the game. Um, and like Tom mentioned, it's to me, I mean, no disrespect to South Africa, but there are two wickets there that you need to take. And then you have a real shot at beating them. If you get Woolvart and Cap out early, um, mm. I know Tasmin Brits made some runs today, but if you get the two of them out early, you have a real chance of doing something because they don't have that good of a batting lineup in comparison to some of the other top teams that you play, right? Um, and we did see that in the World Cup game where we did put them under pressure, where once you got a few wickets and got cap back in the pavilion, there's a bit of pressure on those batters to show whether they, whether they are capable of carrying things through. Sune Lewis is obviously good, uh, but beyond that, it's very unproven, I would say, uh, the batting lineup. Chloe Tryon can get some runs as well, but you know, you guys know what I mean, right? Like it's mm -hmm. it's those two are the key wickets. Um, I think the pitches again are going to play a big role. Today's pitch was really true. Bat ball was coming on to the bat really well. Um, so there is a bit of an adjustment to be made. Of course, Sri Lanka's strength is the spinners. Um, and the batting tracks will hopefully help Sri Lanka's batters get more runs. I mean, mm. if if I hope they were watching the WPL because the likes of someone like you know uh, Jemima Rodriguez, um, she's very much like most of the Sri Lankan players we have, right? She she doesn't she's, she doesn't have the power of uh, Atapatu or maybe uh, Alisa Healy, but she's able to still keep scoring at more faster than a runner ball, strike, striking at, I think, about 140, 150 in some of those games, just by picking her shots well um, and and really maximizing her her mm. strengths, um, which is, I think, a huge thing that our players can learn, particularly the likes of Harshita, uh, Vishmi Gunaratna is another one. So those are, I think, areas that you would want to see some improvement and at least some development, even if Sri Lanka don't, aren't able to win either one of the series, then if we can see those things, I can I think we can be kind of hopeful going into the World Cup because you don't want to go in there depending on other path, right? Because yeah, you might win a game or two, but you don't want to put all that responsibility on her. You want the others making runs and you want to see the team making the 150s and 160s because now the women's game is also, you know, getting a lot more fast scoring. Um, but it should be an interesting series overall. I'd like to see them hold on to catchers. I mean, today, if they did, Cap would have been dismissed pretty early. Yeah. Uh, Woolward got 100 in the end. She was also dropped, I think, in her 60s or 70s. So, uh, huge opportunities and not, I mean, two of those three catchers were not difficult catchers, right? And this has been a consistent bad area for Sri Lanka. I mean, they've had, they've worked with the high performance coaches, they've worked with the men's coaches, they've, I think they've got a new fielding coach on board as well. The ground feeling is, feeling is okay and you can see them giving that effort, but the catching is just, it doesn't seem to get, to be improving because every game you see at least a couple of catches going down. So, lots of areas I think for the first game that they need to improve on, but like Dom said, I mean, they brought things back against England brilliantly in that series. Um, they just need someone to kind of inspire them a bit because they haven't played a lot of international cricket in the last couple of months. So something to kind of spark that. And if they have a good series here, the qualifiers are coming up, right? And they can get, gain a lot of uh, confidence there as well. Um, it, it's it, it's interesting because last year was their kind of I think it was their breakout year or their re breakout year maybe after going to Grand during COVID and uh, you know they had a lot of a lot of success against New Zealand and England but kind of feel that actually maybe going into this series South Africa might be better prepared than New Zealand and England were to face them last year and that you know they they like all good teams have got to find different ways of winning different ways of improving. They, you know, they won't be, South Africa won't be taking them as, as unseriously as, say, England did last year, right? They'll be they'll be fully prepared for them. And that's where they've got to, I think they've just got to find extra levels. There's a lot happening with, with women's cricket at the moment in Sri Lanka, right? So you've got the, the under-19 series um, is due to begin, I think, probably the day this show's released or the day after we record it. 
uh, where they've got England and, and Australia over. Obviously, England and Australia have come to Sri Lanka because Sri Lanka is the place where you develop young players. Um, and, and actually, you know, I say that kind of as a joke, but, you know, it, it's kind of an honour that the two biggest women, sorry, or the two most developed in terms of the the development of players, women's teams are, are, are bringing young sides over to, to, to learn there. And uh, we, we found out about, about the Asia Cup coming to, to Sri Lanka in June, which personally, there's a little bit of sadness in it because it means that uh, Charmy won't be coming to London uh, right at the beginning of, of, of the 100. I think she'll miss the first week or two of it, possibly. Um, but it's good to see that after last year's success, they're not resting on their, resting on their laurels and they are still trying to push push the game forward. Nick, I'll come to you with your thoughts on on kind of women's cricket in Sri Lanka in the moment. But I, start, I do have one question. It's the question I always ask you when we have to talk about the young women's teams or the, the age-grade women's teams is, where the players come from? Because, as we always talk about, cricket isn't played in girls' schools, often up to girls as much. They have to go and find the game, sniff the game out for themselves. Do you know much about the Sunder 19 squad at all? And, and can you give us any insight or tell us any players to, to watch out for? Yeah, there are lots of, I think, um, kind of plans being put into place to find players at that level because of the Under-19 World Cup, right? We had one last year. Uh, I think in 2025, there will be another one. So that's the main kind of objective with these with these tri-series and stuff. And um, as far as I know, this squad, I haven't play, seen them playing, obviously, because a lot of, I mean, none of what they play is telecast, right? Uh, apart from the World Cup, I do think the core of it is the, is the team that went to South Africa for the World Cup. And they've added a few players. The way they do it is that there are a few schools that play uh, hardball cricket. And I think that number is increasing now, which is great to see. And, you know, to be honest, <laughs> we sit on Sri Lanka cricket all the time, right? About how, how, the lack of support and all of that. I think they're kind of doing a good job now. I mean, this the Tri-Series against Australia and uh, England is going to be live streamed on the YouTube channel as well as on, on free to air TV in Sri Lanka, which is great because, you know, reading from a scorecard, you don't really see, you don't learn much about the players, right? Mm -hmm. But actually being able to watch them, I think even if it's for the selectors or whoever else can give them other opportunities, it'll be really valuable. Who knows, we might have a like player breaking into the national side from that under, under 19 squad, right? Um, so I think that, that, development is slowly coming um i if i was to say someone to watch out for it would be manudi nanakara the captain i believe she's only like 16 years old um not the oldest in the squad uh but she has shown some quality with both bat and ball there are also a couple of others who featured in the world cup and did well i think those will be the ones everyone's looking out for. Also, interestingly, Vishmi won't be there, right? She featured in their last series, but obviously she's with the South African team. I don't know if you guys have an opinion on it, whether Sri Lanka pushed her into the national setup too early and whether maybe she needed to spend a little more time in the under-19 level. Uh, well, like my thoughts on shit houseery, I've got to be consistent on this and think and say that I think they were right to push her into the team because I think I was calling for it. Like basically, the first time she she scored like a what was it four hundred runs and like fifty balls when she was like fourteen or something. So um, yeah, she should definitely be in the team. Sorry, Nick, go ahead. You were about to say something. No, I was going to say I'm possibly think it was a bit early for her because um, we've seen a run of low scores, haven't we, in full international cricket. But I think the Under-19 World Cup is going to be really interesting because the Sri Lanka team at the moment's got sort of a female equivalent of dads and lads about it, doesn't it? A bit there's like you've got some very young players and then a few who are fast approaching 40. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if we see some new prospects coming through. I think that things with Sri Lankan women's cricket seem to be going well. While I was doing talks out in Sri Lanka in January, I got like three or four questions about it, which I, 
I thought was really cool because, you know, five years ago, people weren't generally asking. And I feel like the attitude around women's cricket is really changing. Um, you know, it's very well known that um, the sort of Anglican, you know, upper middle class schools have been the breeding ground for men's cricket. And someone in the note told me that it was mm. kind of the opposite for women's cricket, that, um, you know, Colombo middle class schools had thought that it was possibly unladylike for their girls to be playing cricket. And I think that attitude seems to be changing. I hope it's changing fast. I don't know. What do you guys think? Look, I, I don't spend enough time in Sri Lanka, especially not around women, because I'm a married man. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll have to defer to Estelle and maybe Dominic have, have an opinion on this. Yeah, I think Nick is right. I mean, the men's game was pushed by these schools in Colombo, right? Um, and, and a lot of the missionary schools that had these big matches and kind of, you know, grew the game like that. But in terms of the women, it doesn't quite work in the same way. But I do think that they're bring, they're trying to bring um, the concept of big matches in and get the schools involved. Because uh, I think Nick would have seen this at St. Thomas's. But it's for those for any boy who joins St. Thomas's, his goal in life is not like when you start playing cricket, it's not to play for Sri Lanka. It's that they want to play a big match and they want to like do well at a big match. And you'll still hear people. I, I know about Jeevan Mendes, uh, a guy who used to, who was a few years junior to him in school, used to come and tell me like, you know, we used to watch him during the intervals batting. Like those are their stars. They're not looking at international cricket per se, right? So that kind of creates um, that environment, that competitive environment and, you know, that kind of interest in the game that you won't see if, your school doesn't have cricket. So they're trying to kind of uh, put that together in the women's, in the girls' schools as well. Uh, guys, should we leave it over there? Uh, we'll be back in, well, next week, because that's what we do, something every week for you. Um, if you haven't done so already, please sign up to the newsletter. It comes into your email inbox. It's free as well. I've got to go now because I've got to collect my jaw off the floor because I heard Estelle say nice things about Chandima and <laughs> Sri Lanka cricket as well. Um, uh, this is the Mirror End. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Please hit the subscribe and tell all your friends um, about us. We uh, talk about Sri Lanka cricket every week. See you later. Bye.